It's time for the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is the voice of the working class, Rick Smith. Welcome, brothers, sisters, working class heroes. This is the Rick Smith Show. Thanks so much for being here today on the big program. Lots to get to, lots to talk about. Federal Reserve uh, jacking up the interest rates another three quarters of a percent. And I'm going, um, is it is it that the Fed wants to destroy the economy? Is it that they want to slam on the brakes with both feet and screech the car down the road till it gets off into the ditch? Because it, that's, that's the only thing I'm thinking of this fast to continue to raise interest rates. And then they're talking about more in the next two meetings, maybe another 1.25% increase. Um, I got to tell you, I think our inflation isn't is it because of this? And I think the damage that they're going to do, look, I'm not an economist, but it seems a bit aggressive. In fact, the last time the Fed did something like this, 1990, 1990 brought us massive recession. Um, in fact, actually you know, harmed H.W. Bush pretty substantially, uh, which kind of makes me go, and, and I may be, this may sound a bit conspiratorial, and I'm sure that this isn't the sole bit of thinking, but there's part of me that goes, you know, there are those in the wealth class that that want recession. In fact, if you watch some of the the, the, the YouTube, the, uh, the Instagram, TikTok video commentators, some of the rich people are, who claim to be rich, they say that we desperately need a recession, you know, to get things back in order. And, you know, the more I see that frame being laid out in front of me, uh, the more I, I hear the, the wealth class saying, you know, we need to get things back the way, you know, where they, where they used to be. Um, kind of makes me go, well, is this really more about getting workers back in the line with all the organizing going out and with them, with, you know, Teamsters marching in Seattle against on Amazon? Um, is this to make people, well, hurt, make them desperate, make them pliable again. So, well, force them back to work. Because, you know, I happened to watch Fred Smith, the uh, the, the founder and head poncho over at uh, FedEx. And he was on one of, the, one of the talking head business shows talking about how, you know, Biden created this, this inflation with, you know, the infrastructure bill and the, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act and, you know, the, the, the college forgiveness. You know, he's, he's creating all this inflation. And you go, wait a second, but the, the, the Inflation Reduction Act, they haven't spent a dime on that yet. How has that caused the inflation of the last year? Well, you know, because it, it isn't. This is greed driven. This is driven by a, a supply chain that's been severely broken because it was ill-conceived from the beginning. This is a this is a whole bunch of problems, all, all coming together, the perfect storm, to where they only feel they have one tool, and that is to smash the economy with massive interest rate, rate hikes and fast. Because it's about it's about getting, you know, people back getting back to work and getting them back to work for what? Well, desperation poverty wages. Don't 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 have them asking for better wages, hours, conditions. Don't give them the ability to, to change jobs. So for me, a big part of this, a big part of this has to do with getting things back the way they the way they used to be. You know, where people were just just glad to have a job. Just just lucky to have a job. You remember that frame? Uh, we're going through the great resignation right now where you know the right to work states are losing their minds with people leaving jobs. Uh, and as I talked about recently, the, the Wallet Hub folks said, you know, the nine of the top 10 states that have the highest resignation rates, the quit rates, the people who say, take this job and shove it, those are right, no rights at work states. Mostly in the South, but, you know, across the Southwest. And why? Because people have had enough. And when I see people like Fred Smith out there going, hey, you know, uh, 
It's Biden's fault. It's all these these policies that are going to bring manufacturing back, that are going to invest in our infrastructure, that are going to help us deal with climate change, that are putting us on the path, I believe, towards prosperity. And away from the last 40 years of supply side voodoo Reaganomics and neoliberal horrible. And this is on both sides of the aisle. Uh, the fact that we're talking about reshoring manufacturing, investing in, in infrastructure, clean technologies, and oh, by the way, the most important part of it, workers organizing collect for collective bargaining rights to share in the wealth that their labor creates. Because you, know, you go back to when we, we think about the good old days, you know, the, the leave it to beaver era, the Mayberry era, that was built on, on strong government investment, high taxation on the wealthy, and strong labor unions to demand a fair share of the wealth that their labor creates. That is the 1950s and 60s. That's what built the most prosperous working class in history. That was the model. And it was global because we set that up around the world. Just like we set up this race to the bottom. We've done this globally. I think it's important that this administration be recognized for trying to move us away from that 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 area but it's incumbent on us you know elections elections matter uh, so when i see this i, I got to ask the question you know is is this about at least in some in part slamming on the brakes causing the crisis ca causing the recession that the wealthy want because what the wealthy understand is when recession hits the working class of this country is cash poor they can't weather a crisis so they're desperate and pliable and oh by the way Tons of wealth to be made. I was watching one of the videos going, you know, now's the time to get cash rich. Now's the time to hold on to all your cash so that when the recession hits, you can buy up assets cheap because that's how rich people stay rich. They never sell their houses. They never sell their property. They never sell. They never sell. They hold on to because they know over time it's going to appreciate. But when bad times hit, well, that means you lose your home. Your family loses its home. And someone gets the, who's cash, cash rich, they get to come in and buy it up cheap. Your loss, their gain. And that's how our economy has been, been structured for, for far too long. And I'm saying, you know, in a, we're at a moment where we can change that. But we're, election, we're one, maybe two elections away from, you know, being right back in the heart of, of that horrible Awesome. To me, that's why it's part of the reason we're doing the Working Class Heroes Tour. Uh, we're going to be kicking that off on September 30th. Uh, it's part of the reason we need to have these conversations and, and hammer this stuff out. And I'd love to hear your thoughts. Give us a call, 1-866-416-RICK, 1-866-416-7425. Uh, you got any other ideas on why the Fed is slamming on the brakes? Look, I understand it's the tool that they have to try and bring things a little bit. But wow, this, this aggressively? I got to tell you, I think the medicine little medicine will probably kill the patient in this in this view. Uh, anyway, today I had the honor and the privilege on one of our sister on one of our affiliate stations, WCPT AM 820, to, to be part of a diversity, equity and inclusion panel. Uh, yep. Uh, the the old white guy, straight white guy on the diversity and equity and inclusion panel. Yeah, I fit. I fit in like a well, a giant red thumb. And look. And as I said, the, the reality is that the reason I think these things are important is from a labor guy's perspective. We get sliced and diced and pitted against each other on every front. Uh, male, female, white, black, gay, straight, you know, this religion, that religion. You know, what, However they can figure out to pit us against each other. So we don't ask for better wages, hours, conditions. Because for me, everything comes back to the kitchen table. Everything comes back to... Can you support your family? Can you keep a roof over your family's head? Can you, you know, prepare for your children to grow up and go to college? And, and can you lead a decent life? And can the work that you do, well, fund that? I believe we can have a system that does that. But as long as we're pitted against each other, not going to happen. And you go back to our labor history. And one of the things I talked about is, you know, in the South, after at the end of slavery, you know, what they did is they, 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 they passed laws to lock black people up for no reason. Oh, well, you were standing around. <laughs> Go to jail. And they would give them lengthy jail sentences. And then the states had these lease convict agreements 
uh, where they would lease out these these people that they, they arrested for chumped up nonsense, and they would use them to break strikes. So the white workers who were in the mines going, hey, we want we want better wages, hours, conditions, their strikes were being being broken up by by people who didn't have a choice. But it was that that visual that that division that caused them to hate each other. And look, they were both going to the bottom. And the pe people cashing in, well, the folks in the ivory tower. So for me, again, it's it's never the issue. I never look at the issue from the right left frame, from the black white frame. Uh, and as I said, look, I grew up in a housing project on the west side of Cleveland, a minority in a minority community. We used to play a neat game. And I said this, we play a neat game. It's called Chase the White Kid and Beat Him Up. I'm sure it was a fun game had I not been the white kid. And I always joke because I, I joke that I'm half black. The other half at the time was blue, uh, you know, because I got beat up a lot. Get it? Black and blue. Yeah. Uh, so but I did realize at a very young age, and this is where the point is, that black and white didn't matter as much as green. The color that mattered most was green, and neither of us had it. We were both broke. And and while we were supposed to be pitted against each other, when you don't have food at the end of the month, when you're worried about keeping the roof over your head, that division on, on race doesn't seem to matter as much. But you start moving up the up the economic ladder where we're creating the hunger games, where we're going, hey, if, if, if they win, you have to lose. This is where the division happens. And this is where we need to start start coming together. And this was my point while being the, the, the straight white guy on the panel. Um, this is why it's important. We have to put these differences aside if we're going to move forward as, as workers, uh, as a country, as, as a citizen. Uh, we don't always have to agree individually, but as a matter of the country moving forward, we have to come together in the workplace for me uh, is that place where we do it. And I told the story, look, you know, 30 years ago, we had someone who was transgender back then. And do you know who cared? Nobody. Uh, this person went and we'll say his name was Ron at the time. Ron went away, was gone a couple of months. Ron came back, was Rana. Nobody cared. Because, well, got to keep, keep their job, uh, did the same job, made the same wages, lived their life. Life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. Nobody cared. Now, did people talk behind her back? Yeah. yeah, but they talked behind his back, too, because that's what we do. Uh, individually, you're not going to change hearts and minds on the, on, in, the, in the moment. But institutionally, that's where we have to move forward. Uh, so, you know, it's one of those things. Now, again, you're always going to have people pitted against each other, like this story coming out of Michigan. Uh, there's a guy running for Congress who's caught everyone's attention in this day. Uh, his name is John Gibbs. Uh, you know, black guy went to went to Stanford, uh, but while he was at Stanford, he uh, founded, I guess, a, a think tank, uh, if you want to call it that, uh, the Society for for the Critique of Feminism, I guess, is what it what it was, and it argued that um, women, you women folk, you don't have this, you don't have the characteristics necessary to govern. Sorry. Yeah, you, yeah, you just don't have it in you. Sorry, men are smarter than women. Uh, this is this is the this is the the black gentleman making his assertion again, dividing us, not just on black white but male female, uh, because he didn't make the argument that black women couldn't govern. He said all women, and he's kind of taking a shot for it now because well he's uh, he's running for Congress now. Will this matter to the MAGA crowd? Doubt it. But it is interesting to see how individually we're able to pick and choose where institutionally, I think we all understand. Women and men, they've got different skills, different talents, but neither is is better or worse at governing. We could argue we're all bad at it, especially when, we, when our Republican friends who write nonsense like this at uh, made up think tanks <laughs> think that they know how to govern best, which is to destroy uh, anyway, love to hear your thoughts. 1-866-416-RICK. 1-866-416-7425. Going to take a quick break. Right back on the other side. Going to talk a little bit about the uh, the little the little announcement that came out of New York today. Something came out of New York. Maybe we'll, we'll figure that out. Uh, right back after this. Stick around. From the steel mills of Pennsylvania, to the auto factories of Michigan, to the modern makers movement, 
Manufacturing makes our nation great. I'm Scott Paul, president of the Alliance for American Manufacturing. We bring business and labor together to advocate for policies that everyone can agree on. Together, we can strengthen manufacturing and create good paying American jobs. Help us keep it made in America. People have been saying that we feel a shift in the climate for decades. Climate change is here. The time is now to pass the torch on to the next generation of clean energy warriors. We need to put the land back to work for our people. That means creating jobs for them to live and thrive in our communities. The time is now. Congress must invest in clean energy. It takes a lot to raise a family. A good job, a good salary, and some patience. A lot of people my age are drowning in college debt, but I chose a different path. I'm a member of the IBEW, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. I work hard for my job, and I love what I do. I had a lot of choices for my future, but I made the best choice for my family. IBEW, the right choice. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So I'm I'm guessing uh, someone's going to take uh, someone's going to, to 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 have some some problem with Mr. Gibbs's comment that uh, that women are, are not as smart as men and can't govern. Uh, let's go to the phones and, and let's, let's I'm sure Alice is going to have a thought on this, Alice. Uh, what do you make of this? Are, are women just 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 dumb? Is that the is that the point? Obviously, the man is deluded, <laughs> and he knows nothing of history. <laughs> so we have a problem. Not with a that. thing. Oh, I have a problem with it. A, a big problem. Apparently, he knows nothing of history. Of course, you know uh, we have we have been indulging in this revisionist history, you know, for a couple of centuries. But when you look back and take away the revisionism, there was actually a period of, oh, for about 2,000 years in the, in the Middle East, where Turkey and, and whatnot, where um, it was ruled by women for over 2,000 years, and there was absolutely no war. And then, of course, you know, some of the uh, steep tribes came in that were patriarchs and took over, but uh, obviously he knows nothing. Alice, shh. Shh, not allowed to say that because they weren't Americans. I don't care. <laughs> I I can trace my heritage back. Can he? Uh, See, now I'm going to pull out that elite card because I'll do that every once in a while. All right, all right. We got the word from the elitist. I got you. I got you, Alice. You're, you're pulling the elite card. I got it. <laughs> well, you know, I have the ancestry. I don't have the money, but I do have the ancestry and the education. So there you are. Good stuff. Appreciate it, Alice. Thanks so much. Uh, bye bye. Uh, I I would hope, and this is one of those moments where you hope that women would take offense to that and and then go vote. See, because voting is the way to. You know, in this country, we we express ourselves. Uh, now remember, you remember remember Al, the stories of Al Capone. You know, murder, mafia, you know, crime, all that stuff. It was the IRS that took down Al Capone. No, not none of the other criming that went on. Uh, interesting to, to kind of bring that up in this moment. Uh, and also interesting to remember that uh, Rick Scott, if you remember Rick Scott's 11 point plan, uh, he wanted to cut the I, he wants to cut the IRS by half. You know, the richest guy in the Senate wanting to cut the IRS. It kind of makes you wonder. Uh, so. Also, remember when, when Hillary and, and Donald Trump were in the debates and she pointed out that he had paid no federal income tax for a bunch of years and Trump didn't bother to deny it. In fact, said that makes him smart. Remember that? Well, today, the uh, the attorney general of New York, Letitia James, uh, has has charged that he, that Trump, his adult children, uh, the Trump organization, all of them were involved in what they are saying expansive fraud. That lasted over a decade uh, that Trump himself did death launch. And, you know, some of the stories coming out of it, you go, well, you know, they're just piling on. You go, 
one of the stories that caught my attention is they were saying some of his properties he had overvalued. And I, I know people say, well, you know, we all overvalue our property a little bit. Yeah, you know, so that we can get the you know the loan to you know refinance our house. And look, they all do a little bit. But some of his properties, 3300 percent So I was I was thinking about this today. And I'm going, you know, okay, because understand, this is what rich people get away with all the time. So the good thing is. Well, I don't think anything's going to come out of this for Trump. Maybe a slap on the wrist, maybe a fine. Who knows? But I think this is an opportunity to look at what rich people all across the board get away with. And we don't hold accountable. Think about this. If you had, let's say, a thousand dollar house and that you over over inflated that one thousand dollar house. Thirty three hundred percent you would have a boatload of money, right? Right? You'd have $3.3 million, just, to, just around that area, right? So what if you, uh, oh, I don't know. What if you said, yeah, I'm going to take out a loan against that, that $3 million home, and I'm going to take you know $2.5 million out in equity. I remember the house is worth $1,000. And you're going to take out this massive loan. And then you could file bankruptcy. They can have the house. You got all this money. Who pays for that? Oh, it's the banks. No, no, it's you. It's me. The banks don't lose money. They just pass the costs on to everyone else. Also understand, Trump used to, was giving away land and buildings and, and stuff in charitable fashions so that they could write it off. Because, again, it's about, it's about minimizing the tax liability. In those years that they pay nothing, you know, some of this stuff happens. And it makes him look good. It makes him look philanthropic. He's giving away land. And rich people do this stuff. Giving away assets that they massively overvalue. And then they get to write it off. So you wonder how rich people don't pay taxes. You wonder how they get away with all this stuff. They play these kind of games that nobody ever, never holds holds them accountable. Now remember, you know, I, I brought up Rick Scott and his 11-point plan. This idea that that he can then gut the IRS by half so that nobody ever, nobody ever bothers to look into that. Nobody ever bothers to hold these people accountable for the things that they're getting away with. I mean, it's it's really insane when you stop and think about it. But we, we allow it to happen and we, we don't bother. We don't bother because, well, we're too busy looking at each other. Oh, that's the part that gets me. Uh, it just is what it is. Let's let's go to the phone line. He's got MJ on the line. MJ, how are we doing today? Rick, thank you so much for taking my call. And I love the topic that you guys are talking about, education. And I believe that so much is being impacted in, at education is that we don't have proper funding for it. And we really need to put more funding into education. I don't know, you know, in Colorado, where I used to live, they had a lot of the education funded from the cannabis industry. And so a lot of these states don't have that, and it's not federally you know, regulated or legal yet. So that's one thought. But I think with what's happening with all these schools in the South, and particularly the red states, is it's being really impacted by theology and theocracy. And so they're nominating all these very, very, very far right uh, individuals to be on the school boards. And so that's where they're starting to really take the whole thing of banning books yep. put in place. And I know it's it's something for educators like your guest, Irene, is having difficulty dealing with that, I'm sure, at the college level because of uh, the whole loan forgiveness thing has been kind of uh, uh, thrown like a match into a firebox. So I understand that, too. Yeah, absolutely. And it's always been my view that you don't fund education through gimmicks and, and through vices. Uh, it should be something that we, we fund as a matter of course, not because of gambling winnings like we do in Ohio or uh, or, you know, or, or, or pot like they do, like you said, in Colorado. We should be doing it as a matter of course. Uh, I'm with you, MJ. I, and I appreciate the thoughts. Thanks. Hey, thank you. Good stuff. Uh, you know, seriously, I mean, at the end of the day, we, we really need to prioritize. And oh, by the way, uh, start start taxing the wealthy again, especially people like Trump. Can take a quick break. Right back after this, stick around. You listen to the Rick Smith Show. Calling all builders. 
All welders and roofers, engineers and electricians, calling all brick masons and boiler makers, steel workers and steam fitters. Your country is calling you to rebuild America, to create a cleaner, safer, more prosperous future for all. Tackling climate change, this is the job of our lifetime. It's time to build back better. Let's get to work. Corn Pops, Fruit Loops, Rice Krispies, with a side of paper plates and napkins. We love the country, the country's in trouble. It's gotta be solved fairly quickly. Uh, yes. when, you're, when, you're, when you're with your MyPillow, you got my phone. My name is Linda Paulson, Republican and awesome. That if you have a dude that is wearing makeup, they need to be confronted and say, that's wrong? Why don't you just work on maybe getting your testosterone levels up a little bit? I do wear makeup. I want a very big, big capable airplane. What has any fifth grader done to have made the world better because he or she is in it? I'm just glad to be in a room where I'm one of the oldest people. As a female adult, I know what a woman is. They just keep talking about cows and meat all day long. Republicans will let kids just be kids. See, I'm getting emotional. This comes with an NFT, a token version as well. Oh, still don't get that. And my pronouns are patriot and ass kicker. ago where I was in my dream. How many of you guys have dreams? I got eagle bumps. We don't get we don't get goosebumps here. I hollered I loved him. And he stopped and he said I love you too and then he thought he said this guy says he loves me and I said wait I'm a woman. Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So Bob sent me an email during the break that uh, he says the whole uh, the whole the whole case against Trump is fraudulent itself. That's the real fraud, Bob says. That this is a political witch hunt, again, his words. And I think he's been watching Trump a little bit. And and I guess, you know, to Trump's credit, uh, he, well, he's not going to sit back and, and, and defend himself. He's going to go out on, on, on the Hannity show and attack, attack, attack. And I say, good on you, Don. Keep it up. Keep keep shooting the mouth off. Uh, as my grandfather always said, you have the right to remain silent. Maybe you should use it. Uh, anyway, here to share some thoughts on these uh, fraud charges uh, brought by Letitia James, the attorney general there in New York. I've asked Chris Hahn to come talk with. He's a syndicated radio host, host of the Aggressive Progressive podcast. Chris, thanks for taking time for us. Anytime. So it's it's a witch hunt. It's it's a fraud on the fraud case. Uh, what do you think of Bob's assertions? Yeah, uh, Bob, they keep finding all these witches. So if it is a witch hunt, <laughs> uh, it's going well uh, for the hunters of the witches, particularly if by witch you mean fraud and crimes and abuse of power, because that's what it is. And, you know, here's the thing that struck me today uh, in the last hour or two where I really was kind of focusing on this, getting ready for your show. Um, twice today, both by Letitia James and by the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit, it was said that presidents of the United States, former presidents of the United States, are no different than anyone else, and frankly, in the eyes of the law. And frankly, that is the way we always thought things would be in this country. No man or woman is above the law. No man should get special treatment because of their office, their wealth, their birth. Uh, and Donald Trump has consistently tried to assert that he should be treated differently. And Judge Cannon down in Florida asserted that he should be treated differently. Um, 
you know, thank God some judicial sanity has set in in Florida today with the 11th Circuit's opinion on the on, on the document case. And of course, Letitia James said the same thing earlier today that the president of the United States should not be treated different. Former president of the United States. Yeah, I mean, you know, the reality is, is um, and I said this a moment ago, you know, they, uh, they got Al Capone, uh, the IRS got Al Capone for all his crimes. Could this be what, what they finally get him on? But doesn't this, you know, and Billy Barr was out there saying that, well, you know, the, the, the case isn't all that strong. He doesn't think it's going to gonna, gonna, gonna lead to anything. But they're, bre- they're dragging in the children, Christopher, like, you know, like, um, like yeah. Don and, and Eric and Ivanka are, are like six-year-olds. But they're dragging in the children. How low do you have to be to drag in the children? You know, the well, children who are executives in the company. Yeah, I mean, Don Corleone, you know, Sonny Corleone got shot on the causeway. It is the children are part of the family business there, unfortunately. And yeah, I genuinely don't like it when the children of politicians get dragged into the political fight. But when one of them worked in the White House, the other one was the president of his company or a director of his company. I'm sorry, you're you're dragged in. You're part of the scheme. You are knowing a knowing participant. And it's not like they're 10 years old. They are grown ass men and women. And they are perfectly capable of saying no daddy and moving on from it, but they did not. So yes, if and look, I don't know what he meant by she doesn't have a case. This is not a criminal case. He will not go to jail for this. This is a civil case. You do not need to be proven guilty by a reasonable doubt in a civil case. The rule in a civil case is preponderance of evidence, meaning more likely than not that a crime was committed or a tort in this case or a, uh, a civil uh, rule being broken. Um, I don't know. I didn't read the entire brief. It's 200 pages long. I don't think Bill Barr read it either. It's 200 pages long. Uh, seems to me that she wouldn't be bringing this case if she didn't think she had a preponderance of evidence. It would be... I think, you know, political, you know, misconduct, not pit misconduct, uh, malpractice by her to do that. Right. Now, you know, again, you look at this and, um, you know, there are those who are saying, well, why isn't this a criminal indictment? If, if this is fraudulent, if he committed fraud, why doesn't she bring criminal charges? Now, it's my understanding she's the attorney general. That's not their job. That's, that's the district attorney's job, is right? Right. Yeah. I mean, look, I, in certain cases, there are criminal crimes that can be brought by the attorney general. Uh, but it, it's clear to me, look, they have a pretty good track record in the New York State Attorney General's office of getting convictions against Donald Trump in civil cases. The, he cannot operate his charity anymore in New York. Had to pay $2 million uh, to, to real charities in New York because of how he misused, mis, misused his foundation to fund his own stuff. So, you know, civil cases, I, look, I don't think, I, I think people have to understand this about Donald Trump. It's going to be very hard to ever send him to jail. You know, I've been talking about this for a couple of years now, I think. I, I don't think he's ever going to jail. It's I agree. Not going to never, ha- never going to happen. Right. But, you know, one of the things he loves is being rich and having his names on buildings. And in New York, particularly, there are many buildings with his name on it, um, some of which, you know, the co-op boards are kicking the name off of, but many of which he owns outright or his company owns. Uh, for him to have to sell off his New York assets... Uh, you know, as much as he wants to downplay his ties to New York these days, Donald Trump is a born and raised New Yorker who always wanted to make it in New York and removing his names from buildings in New York and not allowing him to do business in New York anymore is going to be like putting him in jail in a lot of ways. And yeah. it, it, it will be a sad day for him. Yeah, I mean, the legacy, not quite what he was hoping for, but, you know. No, I, no. I, 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 I almost feel bad about it. Uh, if I if I didn't think he was such a horrible person trying to destroy this country, I'd almost feel feel bad for him. But I, I don't. Yeah, no. I, you're looking at me like, what do you mean, Phil? Not really. <laughs> but it, no, because, you know, I've, I've had a couple of conversations with people that go, well, what's, you know, what's the big deal? One of the main you know, crimes that they, they kind of me committed is overinflating the value of his properties. Yes. And, and and it sounds innocuous enough. Oh, OK. You know, everyone wants to get a little bit more out of their properties. But when you start looking at it, one of the numbers, thirty three hundred percent, he inflated yeah. properties. You go, that's a little bit more than just a little bit. 
Yeah, we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars. He said that mar largo was worth $750 million. It's worth $75 million. He said his apartment in New York City was ten that was 30,000 square feet. It's 10,000 square feet. 10,000 square feet is still a huge apartment. It'd be a huge house. Uh, it's still a very valuable asset, but it's not the asset he said. And the crime is, is that he went to banks and said, give me a loan based on this. Uh, and, and yes, people, I, I, look, is it a common thing that people do when they're talking about their real estate? Because you don't really know what your real estate is worth at any given time. The market fluctuates. So you have some wiggle room in estimating what your real estate, you don't have 350% wiggle room or 33%. Or, or, you, know, you, know, yeah. you know how big it is. You know, the difference between 10,000 and 30,000 square feet. That's an outright lie. And, and that is something that he used to try to make more money and to make himself richer and to defraud banks. Yeah, so what do you say to the to, to people who go, well, who cares? It's just the banks. Who cares if the banks get defrauded? What's that got to do with me? Uh, what it has to do with you is this man wants to be president of the United States again. And I think it's kind of important for people to understand what a fraud he is. And I get it. Uh, you know, you had your guy you know, write you today on Twitter or Facebook, you know, telling you why he's not a fraud. And there's some people who are going to just believe him no matter what. But elections in this country are won on the margins. You don't have to convince everyone that he's a fraud who's voting for him. If one or two or three percent of Trump voters say, I'm done with this guy, he's done. It's over. Can't win. I mean, how many votes did he win? How many votes did he win Pennsylvania by in 2016? It was like less than 100,000 votes. He, he, Biden won Pennsylvania by less than 100,000 votes. 50,000 votes is all you really need there, right? So it's a, it, you know, telling people the truth, showing the fraud that he is to more Americans and keeping them reminded of that. I think it's important. And more importantly than all of that politics that I just went through, no person is above the law. Yeah. No, no. But and he should be treated no differently. But I go back to the 2016 debates when Hillary you know, pointed at him that he doesn't pay taxes. And he said that makes him smart. This is how he doesn't pay taxes. So for me, that that's the this is what rich people get away with all the time. So the fact that, yeah. you know, we're, we're seeing this. You you said that, you know, nobody's above the law. Yes, they are constantly. And I look at Rick Scott, one of the richest guys in the Senate, wanting to gut the IRS in half. Yeah. And going, you know, this all plays into this. So that kind of anger that you see in the working class because people are struggling. Well, he wants to gut the IRS in half, but he wants to make sure that you and I pay more taxes. Exactly. So, you know, this is one of those moments where you go, there is a difference. The wealthy in this country continue to get away from things, get away with things. And while the courts may say everyone's the same, we both know they're not. Yeah, I mean, I got it. But, you know, a lot of rich people go to jail every day. A lot of rich people get brought before courts and they can't say, well, I'm the president. You can't, you know, you can't accuse me of a crime. I mean, his argument in Florida, I know we're going back and forth between two cases here, but I'm much more interested in uh, the Mar-a-Lago uh, raid, if you will. Uh, his argument in Florida, which Judge Cannon accepted was, if you do a criminal investigation of me, it will do irreparable harm. I I'm sorry, criminal investigations do irreparable harm to everyone who gets investigated criminally. That's the point. <laughs> you know, I got to tell you, though, I, while I'm not a Donald Trump fan by any stretch of the imagination, you kind of have to be in awe of the audacity, you know, the giant stones on this guy to pull the stuff that he's he's pulled over I the mean, years and is, continues to do. It is it's amazing. You're right. Uh, it, I am in awe of the cojones on this man. Uh, but I am more in awe of the fact that, man, that was real Long Island to me. I mean, it's it getting was. late for me. I, I'm, a, I'm like not a guy who's like talking this late uh, unless I do a couple of Red Bulls. And you're like in that zone where <laughs> I could still go to sleep. I could still be up. Like if I'm doing a midnight hit on TV, I'm Red Bulling it. I'm wide awake and I can't go back to sleep till like three o'clock in the morning. But I got a 930 hit with you and I'm like, I could probably make it and then go to sleep afterwards. <laughs> Let me do it. But the Long Island comes out when I'm tired. But what, what I'm, what, I even lost my train of thought now. But it, it's it, it's amazing to me how, how this man gets away with it. But it's more amazing to me how people support him still and send him money to fight the lawsuits and the criminal investigations against him. It is amazing to me that that still happens. Yep. That there's 
a working man right now, a guy driving a truck like you do, like my dad did for, for 40 years as a teamster, they're out there working and they're sending their hard-earned money to this guy who's supposed to be a freaking billionaire. And they're sending him their hard-earned money. And they will continue to do that in the face of overwhelming information of his history of criminal and fraudulent activity. And they will continue to do that. Plus, if he's really as rich as he does, it says he is, why does he need your $5 a month? Uh, I, that to me, I got to tell you, that to me is yep. the worst part about this guy. It's the worst thing. No, no. You, look, you know, he's going to tell you. He's smart. He's got other people paying his bills. Uh, yeah. OPM, man. Other people's money. You're listening to The Rick Smith Show. We're with Chris Hahn, syndicated radio host, host of the Aggressive Progressive Podcast. You want to check out his stuff, ChristopherHahn.com. We'll get links out on social media. Now, you're talking about Mar-a-Lago and the uh, the raid. And, and look, we've found out recently how much, you know, classified documents he's had, how, how he's misused it since he left the White House. I want to know how much did he do while he was in the White House? If, if this is what he did when he left, yeah. what did he do while he was there? Well, unfortunately, when he's there, he could do whatever he wants, right? He's the president of the United States, and he is the ultimate declassifier, right? He's the ultimate authority on what is and isn't classified. Now, I am a big believer that we classify far too much in this country, and we probably should, you know, the public and the people should have more access to more things so we know what's going on. Um but that said, I doubt he ever just declassified anything formally. Uh, and that's a big red herring, a big bluff, a big lie. I thought he waved his hands. Isn't that yeah, what Cash no, Patel no, said? Some kind of order. I, I some had kind a of magic order that I only told myself. Uh, it's it's just you know it's first of all, a document itself is not classified. It's the information on that document, and you must assume that that information exists in other parts of the government other than the document that has been handed to the president of the United States for him to review. So if you're going to declassify it, you need to declassify that information wherever it is in the government so everyone has the opportunity to read it and understand what it is. And unless he did that, he didn't declassify anything. So the argument is stupid. It's ridiculous. How Judge Cannon even gave any credence to it at all is beyond me. But the 11th Circuit cleaned it up today. Thank God. Yep. Thank goodness. And we'll we'll see where this did. So does anything come out of this? I mean, you know, ultimately, I've got friends who are saying, no, it's not a big deal. You know, Hillary's emails, Chris. Hillary's emails. Yeah. I mean, Hillary's emails kept her from being president. And as I have said, I don't think the man's ever going to jail. I think that there'll be some sort of punishment here for this. It's, I don't know what it's going to be, but it's not going to be jail. Um but again, I'm not looking for, you know, 50 percent of Trump voters to stop voting for him. No, I'm looking for one or two percent to say I've had it with this man. And I got to tell you, I, I talk to a lot of them. I mean, I, I go on a lot of conservative media. Um, I get a lot of messages from them. I have seen a change in some of them, not all of them. Uh, it, and again, it doesn't have to be much. And I think that if you look at what's going on with the midterm elections right now. You look what happened in New York 19. You look what's, look what's happened in Alaska. People are tired of these scam artists. I mean, Sarah Palin lost to a Democrat for an open congressional seat in Alaska, not because the Democrat ran this great, tremendous campaign. The ECCC, I don't think he even spent any money there. They lost, she lost because the people of Alaska didn't want another Donald Trump didn't want another person who's going to be there just for themselves. And it wasn't everybody. Sarah Palin still got 48% of the vote, but that wasn't enough. 48% does not make you a congressperson in America. So, um, you know, I, I think that there's a, a critical mass forming that is going to defeat Trumpism, not in four years or in, in three years, but this year. I think there's going to be some significant surprises in the elections in November Maybe a governor or two that we're not even thinking is in trouble right now. Interesting. So, so you think Trumpism as a whole could could go down? I'm thinking just Trump uh, and the DeSantis's of the world, the Mastrianos of the world, take that on and go forward. But I hope you're right. I hope. No, I don't think the Mastrianos have any chances in hell of getting elected. I sure hope you're fall. right. From your I mean, lips, Mastriano. Look, 
I, I wouldn't say the same thing about Dr. Oz. Um, because Dr. Oz kind of is like a casual Trumpist, right? Uh, Mastriano is a full blown, you know, probably was in the Capitol. We just don't have any video of it, kind of Trumpist. Yeah, no, I, 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 right. I put him as a um, Nazi. So there's, there's, yeah, that. I mean, exactly. Uh, that guy's not getting elected. People understand who he is, what he's about. And in the same vein that a Sarah Palin loses her election in Alaska, I'm sorry, uh, Alaska is a lot more conservative than Pennsylvania is. And I just don't see a way for Mastriano to win Pennsylvania. Now, my worry about Dr. Oz, and, and I, I do believe we should win Pennsylvania. I believe Fetterman should win it. I worry about Fetterman. Um, I saw his interview last week. I uh, Again, I keep saying this to you. I wish he would uh, put on a collared shirt <laughs> so that the 1% of people who say, what is up with that hoodie, who decide not to vote for him in a state like Pennsylvania, which 1% could really make a difference, it's driving me freaking crazy, Rick. <laughs> I like him. I like what he stands for. Put on a tie. Just a couple of times. Not all the time. Once in a while. So that people know you're serious about the job you're running for. People like, you know, like some 75-year-old retired truck driver who wants his senator to put on a tie. I'll send you a picture. You've got a picture of him in a tie? Sure. They're, they're By the way, he's lost a lot of weight. Yeah, yeah. And I bet you he'd look pretty good in a suit right now. No, he no. should probably put, buy one. Yeah, I've seen him in a suit and tie before. There, okay. there are pictures out there. I will send you one during but the break. Rick, Rick, have you seen it this year? No. I haven't. No. Right? I, I get it. That's his shtick. I don't like shtick in politics. Gotcha. I like winning. And, and, and this is, you know, you know, nothing, you know, the shtick's going to suck if he doesn't have a job next year, right? And we have Dr. Oz for six years, a guy from New Jersey yeah. run, you know, as a senator in Pennsylvania. I, I mean, it's, you know, it, you want to you wanna hold on to the shtick for that? No, I'm with you. you. Want, you I'm with you. Dr. Oz to be the 51st vote for Mitch McConnell? I mean, that's just, that's that's sickening to me. I, I hear you. Did oh, you? Give I know he listens to your show too. Yep. So I'm speaking directly to you, Lieutenant Governor Fetterman, who I like, I find compelling. I want you to win. I'm a political strategist. Pennsylvania is a 50-50 state. There you go. I'm anything a... could turn people off or anything could turn them off. There you go, John. Chris wants you to wear a tie. Good stuff. Chris, I appreciate the time, man. As always, good stuff. I look forward to having you back again real soon. Anytime. Good stuff. Our good friend Christopher Hahn. Make sure you check out his website, ChristopherHahn.com, and the Aggressive Progressive Podcast. Quick break. Right back. For 240 years, our union endured. But it's under challenge like never before. We're engaged anew in a struggle between democracy and autocracy. Can we save democracy? Overcome authoritarian movements at home and abroad? Come together to ensure the government of the people, by the people, for the people endures? We say we can. Democracy will and must prevail. Play your part by joining the union. The union gives Americans the tools to mobilize friends and neighbors, to amplify our voices, organize for democracy, and defeat Trumpists and authoritarians from the White House to the City Council. It matches the skills of volunteers and activists with campaigns and causes, work that must be done to protect democracy. Lincoln believed it was the sacred duty of every president to preserve the union at all costs. We believe it's the sacred duty of every American. Now it's up to all of us, to we the people. Because together, we will win. America will endure. The Union, all in. I've been driving buses for five years and my day-to-day -day routine is I wake up a little earlier than most people. I get on a bus, I go out, I pick up some students and make sure they get to school nice and safe. Here in Fairbanks, Alaska, that can be a challenge because of the winter weather and the icy roads. But I love the job. 
So the Teamsters are great. They provide us a lot of protections. They've always taken care of their people, made sure that our jobs were secure. We didn't have to worry about whether or not we'd have a job from day to day. Uh, and that's amazing because before we'd be working four, six, eight hours a day and only earning minimum wage was real difficult to make a living. And the Teamsters pushed a lot. So we make something we can live off of and not have to have a second job. What absolutely gives me peace of mind. The, the union membership allows me to focus on this job without having to worry about whether or not my family is going to be taken care of. I'm Andrew Case and I'm proud to be Teamsters Local 959. Back to the Rick Smith Show. Check out our website, thericksmithshow.com. You got any questions, comments, thoughts, something in your mind? Email me, Rick at thericksmithshow.com. Make sure you follow us on Twitter at Rick Smith Show. You can shoot a direct message at us, tweet, all of that stuff. Also, Facebook. We do some over there, not as much. So uh, it is what it is. Uh, but here's the thing: this is this is a moment. The important part of this moment is uh, people are looking at unions and going. Maybe this is the answer. And I've been saying this for, well, every minute of the 17 years I've been doing this program, uh, because I truly believe that if we can recreate that, that, that thing that our grandparents' generation built, that kind of an economy that was meant for everybody, not just the, the people sitting up in the, in the ivory towers, but for the working people. And even have business leaders who, you know, like Henry Ford gets, gets credit for saying, hey, our, our workers should be able to buy our cars. Now, granted, that was in his radical self-interest, one of the most anti-union people to ever walk this planet. And for all intent and purposes, not a good guy either. But at least from the business perspective, understood you got to share the wealth. Because if you want you want people buying your stuff, they got to have the money. They, that, that all came to head in the, in the 50s and 60s where you had smart policies, policies that encouraged people to join and form unions and made sure companies bargained. Democrats have got to pick up that mantle with people looking at unions and going, yeah, we want that again. 71% of people in this country, to get 71% of the people on this, in this country to agree on anything is mind-blowing. 80% of young people see this is the way forward. So Democrats, if you're listening, hello, this, this is the message every day. Every time you speak to somebody, oh, hey, by the way, join a union. Oh, hey, by the way, we need collective bargaining rights strengthened in state after state. Because you know what Republicans do masterfully? They stay on message. They stick to it. And then when they get power, when they get power, oh, my goodness, they can't wait to use it. Look at Kentucky. Kentucky, as quick as they could, first day, 9 a.m., they went and they passed the No Rights at Work bill. Pennsylvania, if Doug Mastriano, heaven forbid he does, he wins, if he wins, day one, you know right to work is going to be what they what they go after first because that's the priority, crushing workers and their rights. Virginia, same thing. All of these states did this stuff when they, Scott Walker in, in Wisconsin, this is what they did, take labor rights away. Democrats, you're not doing that. When Democrats took control of all the, both houses in the governor's mansion in Virginia, you didn't see them going, hey, we're going to undo this horrible. No, no, we can't. That'd be divisive. This is where Democrats have got to grab this issue by the you-know-what and, you know, this is where Democrats have got to be the ones who stand up and fight. Now, he brought up Obama and the Employee Free Choice Act. Uh, I met President Obama twice when he was candidate Obama. Shook his hand twice, asked him about the Employee Free Choice Act. He looked me in the eye and told me, we're going to get something better. Got nothing because there wasn't any political capital put behind it. And there shouldn't have had to have been. It should have been a matter of course. It should have been, yeah, of course we're going to pass this. Of course we're going to strengthen collective bargaining rights. Of course we're going to streamline the process to get people to, to be able to pursue their rights without tons of harassment from the, from the employer. Of course we're going to do that. But they don't. So Democrats, if you're listening, the, the working class is looking for a champion. And sadly, they're looking to people like Donald Trump and they're looking to, to crackpots like Mastriano and, and Oz. Be the champion of working people that you want to be. Be the champion of, work, of working people that we need you to be. And push forth positive change. Be that fighter. 
be that that party that that is the party of the working class and you the votes will come this is one of those moments and then all of those side issues will go away you know i've said a million times the whole same sex marriage thing the whole transgender thing in the workplace was dealt with years ago and we wouldn't we wouldn't have to have Joe Biden come out on every individual case and, and make a statement because, no, institutionally, we're moving in the right direction, the direction of life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. But will my Democrat friends listen? I don't know. We'll see. And we're going to find out as we embark on our working class hero road trip kicking off on September 30th, coming to an area near you uh, in the next several, several days. What? Want to hear your thoughts? Email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. By all means, if you miss any portion of the show, podcast, wherever you get yours, you'll find ours. Again, thanks so much for being here. We'll see you back here next time. You've been listening to The Rick Smith Show. Email Rick. At Rick at the Rick Smith Show.com. Until next time, this has been the Rick Smith Show, where working people come to talk.